Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for joining us here at Bethlehem United Church of Christ for Sunday worship. I want you to know that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here right now. You know, I think we are all wiped out. We're tired. We've been home with children. Our college students have had to leave uh, school to come back home. Our students have missed graduations. Parents are worn out from working from home and balancing so much. We haven't been able to go do things like meet our families, meet our friends, gather at a restaurant, hug a friend. And I think it's wearing on us. I think we're tired. Well, I want you to know that that is okay. You can bring all of that with you here today. You don't have to make yourself feel like it's all okay. But we come together to worship our God who is walking with us and loves us exactly as we are with all of our worries and anxieties and gifts. And then we bring all of those here today to this place of worship, trusting that God has a word for us, that God has hope for us, and that God will guide us through the other side of this. And God is working through you and through all of us. Let's go worship our God. We long for community and the presence of God. In whom we live and move and have our being. This day, Christ tells us that we will never be alone. An advocate will share our journey. With whom we will live and create community and celebrate being. May the ever-present love of God be with you. And may the joy of Christ surround you. May we know the presence of the Advocate as we gather in this community of peace, continuing to share the cost of discipleship with deeds of bold mercy and courageous justice. As an Easter people following the risen Lord, may the life of Jesus live on in us and through us. Amen. Good morning, Bethlehem. Uh, this morning we're going to sing hymn number 22, All Creatures of Our God and King. So if you have your hymnal, go ahead and turn to 22 and let's sing that together. We're going to do verses 1, uh, 2, and 3. of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, Alleluia, Alleluia, oh burning sun with golden beam, oh silver moon with softer Praise God, oh praise God, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Oh rushing wind with voice so strong. Clouds that sail in heaven along. Oh, praise God. Alleluia. Oh, rising morn in praise rejoice. You lights of evening find a voice. Oh, praise God. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. 
Speaking God, we have come here today for many reasons, each with our own story. May these reasons and stories be immersed in your sacred story, finding ourselves caught up in the drama and beauty of Jesus' teachings, life, and ministry. Through your Holy Spirit, enable us to move boldly into the future and to fulfill the hope of love that Jesus taught us and lived. Now hear this call to confession. It is written in Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15. In prayer, there is a connection between what God does and what we do. You cannot receive forgiveness from God without forgiving others. If you refuse to do your part, you cut yourself off from receiving God's part. Let us go to God in confidence to be forgiven and forgive others. Please join me in prayer. Holy Advocate, it seems at times we forget that you know us at our very depths. We become anxious and afraid that you are not with us and that our lives have lacked meaning and purpose. You have called us to great things, but we focus instead on what we lack rather than on whose we are. By your mercy, help us to live out the commandments of Christ beyond these walls, beyond this hour, and in so doing, may we become for the world the very presence of justice hope, and peace. Hear these words of forgiveness and assurance. All of us have been created and called to be in community. Know this, but more importantly, live this. As God's children, we are loved and equipped with great ministry. Follow Jesus' commandments to live to love boldly as you are held in the grace and love of God. Please join with us now in the prayer that Jesus taught us in a way which is most familiar to you. Our God who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. While we are apart these days, let us hold each other together by offering the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Let us share a sign of Christ's peace. faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design in the lives of those who prove his faithfulness who walk by faith and not by sight by faith our fathers roam the earth the power of his promise in their hearts of a holy city built by God's own hand a place where peace and justice reign we will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on him our soul's reward Till the race is finished and the work is done, we'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith the prophets saw the day when the longed for Messiah would appear with the power to chains of sin and death and rise triumphant from the grave by faith the church was called to go in the power of the spirit to the lost to deliver captives and to preach good news in every the earth. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done, we'll walk by faith and not by sight. Faith 
this mountain shall be moved. In the power of the gospel shall prevail. For we know in Christ all things are possible. For all who call upon his name, we will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done, we'll walk by faith and not by sight. Oh, we will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward. Till the race is finished and the work is by faith and not by sign. We'll walk by faith and not by sign. We now listen for God's holy word. We have two scriptures today and you'll see them as well on your screen. You also may choose to use your own Bible and even make notes as you hear the scripture. I invite you to listen for a word or a phrase or a question that comes to mind and just trust that because that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you personally about what message might be there. So let us now hear from God's holy word from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 22. If with heart and soul you are doing good, do you think you can be stopped? Even if you suffer for it, you're still better off. Do not give the opposition a second thought. Through thick and thin, keep your hearts at attention. In adoration before Christ, your master, be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks why you're living the way you are, and always with the utmost courtesy. Keep a clear conscience before God, so that when people throw mud at you, none of it will stick. They'll end up realizing that they're the ones who need a bath. It is better to suffer for doing good, if that's what God wants, than to be punished for doing bad. That is what Christ did definitively, suffered because of others' sins, the righteous one for the unrighteous one. He went through it all, was put to death, and then made alive to bring us to God. Christ went and proclaimed God's salvation to earlier generations who ended up in the prison of judgment because they would not listen. You know, even though God waited patiently all the days that Noah built his ship, only a few were saved, eight to be exact, saved from the water by water. The waters of baptism do that for you not by washing away dirt from your skin, but by presenting you through Jesus' resurrection before God with a clear conscience. Jesus has the last word on everything and everyone. From angels to armies, he is standing right alongside God and what he says goes. We now hear from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, and then we will jump over to 7 through 9. And this is about faith in what we cannot yet see. This scripture is like a hall of fame 
of people of faith in our, in our Bible. And here they are lifted up. The fundamental fact of existence is that trust in God, this faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It is our handle on what we cannot see. The act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors, set them above the crowd. By faith, we see the world called into existence by God's word. What we see created, but by what we do not see. It is impossible to please God apart from faith. And why? Because anyone who wants to approach God must both believe that God exists and that he cares enough to respond to those who seek him. By faith, Noah built a ship in the middle of dry land. He was warned about something he could not yet see and acted on what he was told. The result? His family was saved. His act of faith drew a sharp line between the evil of the unbelieving world and the rightness of the believing world. As a result, Noah became intimate with God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. How do we have faith in we, what we cannot see yet? That's a true test. You know, we have hopes, but we also want proof. And sometimes we want proof before we step forward. Sometimes that's a good path, but other times we need to have other resources. You know, we are very much in a time that is a time of grieving. There are three things that I share with a family when I'm speaking with them. A loved one has died. There's many people, they're all feeling grief, but in different ways. Some people feel numb. Some people feel a sense of confidence and everything's okay. And others are so distraught, they don't even know where to begin. And so what I share with a family is there's three things that I think are very important. Number one, celebrate. In the context of a funeral, you are celebrating the life of that person. Not a perfect person, but celebrating all the wonderful attributes and gifts and acknowledging that their life mattered and continues to matter. Celebrate. Number two, acknowledge. To acknowledge that the loss is real. To be able to heal, we have to be able to acknowledge what we are going through is real and at the same time, try to wrap our minds around what does this loss mean? We know that the future will be different. The future will be different. It will not be the same. So the third thing we do is to claim the promises that God makes to each one of us. We celebrate, we acknowledge, and we claim. And what do we claim? We claim that God is with us, God will never abandon us, that even in the midst of times like this, it is not proof of the absence of God, but proof that we are not walking alone, that God promises us that this life is not all there is, and that in this life, in this life, God walks with us. We're all walking through pain, but it makes a huge difference to know you're not walking alone, that there's someone at your side or many at your side that it's a, a chance to see. You know, in the text from Hebrews, we hear this 
story about faith. This is like a hall of fame of those who have been uh, mentors or models of faith. We hear at the very beginning of this that faith, the is the, fu the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God that we have, this faith that we have, is the firm foundation under everything that makes this life worth living. It is our handle on what we cannot see. The act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors and set them above the crowd. By faith, we see the world called into existence by God's word. What we see created by what we cannot see. Right now, we're trying to see the whole picture, but none of us has it. Not the experts, not the government, not our local churches. We want an answer. We want a product, and yet it is not here yet. We understand where we have challenges. We're still figuring out where our resources and our strengths are. And we're going to need to turn to God to help us put those together and cover the gap. The people that God reached out to were ordinary people. These were not people that were any different than us. They were people exactly like us. But what distinguished them was the choices they made. They could make a choice to travel in their own direction or to travel with God in a direction they didn't even know where it was heading, but they knew it was where God was going. And I think that's always the better path because at least we know if we stumble, God is with us. And we can always find a way to have redemption from God and to lean on each other. We need to lean on each other during this time. We need to encourage each other during this time. In this story of God's heroes of faith, none of them pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps. They turned to God and said, this is bigger than us. And God lifted them up so they could actually even put their bootstraps on. And we need to remember that, that the answers are going to have to come from resources that are not just math and statistics and medical information, but we need to find that wisdom about what it means together to find a new normal. Many of these people did not ever get to the point where they realized the destination. And yet by traveling with hope and faith, it became its own prize and reward. They were freed, they were released, because now their conscience was clear. They didn't live out of a place of fear. We see this happening right now in our world where people are responding in a couple of different ways. We see wonderful acts of courage, people helping each other, people going out to serve food, people increasing what they're giving to churches and food banks. We see nurses, we see teachers working from home and parents trying to juggle it all right where they are with children at home and work at home. And it's hard. I know it is hard and you are struggling and it is okay to admit that. If things don't feel normal, it's because they're not. To be completely unaffected by something that's unnormal, that's not normal. Do you understand? To be in an un normal situation and to be thrown off is a normal response for anyone who is in a time of crisis. We emerge from a place where we're in shock, where it doesn't feel quite real, to feeling suddenly the weight of this and understanding the implications of how it's going to be different. And at some point, though, we move on. We do not get rid of the pain but we find that the intensity lessens, and we find new ways of living that honors the past, but still sees what is going on now and the new thing that God is doing. 
I had an interesting email conversation with a friend from my past church, and he was saying that he was really worn out, that he had been putting things on Facebook about we should live more in harmony, that we should love each other, that it's not normal to see people with AR-15s uh, or Confederate flags on our state capitol. That, that is not normal. But we're not in normal times. And we have a choice of the path. We can choose to be afraid, to become our lesser selves, or we can be those people who are looking to be agents of healing and concerned about each other, every person's health, every person's freedom. We need to choose how we're going to do that. Things aren't normal, and in fact, I invite you, if you would like to, in the comments, if you're watching on Facebook, to, to write in there, if you feel comfortable, what is the hardest thing for you right now? What aspect of this is, are you struggling with? And where are you finding a new sense of hope? It's not all one way or the other, but they're mixed together. And it always is that way in this journey with God. I was watching the news uh, yesterday, and I was impressed by a story I saw. Dr. Fauci, who you know has been on the news so much, is our top medical expert, was taking time to be at a conference with children, with teenagers and to answer their questions to understand this situation better. And I was impressed that a young 16-year-old named Jalen asked a question, and her question was this. She said, is this ever going to end, or is this something that we are going to have to be doing for a good portion of our lives? Dr. Fauci told Jay Lynn, she said, he said, I have confidence, I have confidence that this is going to end. He continued and said, I do not think it's going to go away completely, but we are working on a vaccine, and I believe that when we have enough baseline immunity in the community, that this is something you are not going to have to worry about for the rest of your life. That is encouraging news. And he said, it is tough now, and it may be tough for another year, but this is something that will go away, I promise you. We all know Dr. Fauci to be a person of incredible integrity who understands science, but also here is demonstrating as a person of faith for what he can't not even fully see yet, but he knows and feels confident that this time will come to an end and we will move beyond this. This is not the apocalypse or the end of the world. So it is important how we respond. How do we travel in faith during this journey? You know, one of the things we heard in the Peter text that we hear again in Hebrews is that some of the people that God called were asked to do things that seemed so impossible. Noah, for instance, was asked to build a ship in the middle of a desert for something he couldn't even see that didn't even seem possible. And through this, he was saved. Everyone else was offered, but they were the only ones who got on the boat. His act of faith drew a sharp line between the negative of the world, the unbelieving world that needs just information and the rightness of the believing world. As a result, Noah, it says, became intimate with God. I hope during this time we can become intimate with God to know that God is here with us, that we are not alone, and that even though we can't see the end, we can't see that bright, that bright light maybe, it is there, it is coming. You are not alone. I hope you know you can reach out to the church or to me. I know for all of you who have a, a phone directory, all my numbers are in there and my email. I know that you can call the church office, that you can email us, you can text. We wanna know where you're, what you're feeling. We don't have to solve it, we wanna know what you're feeling and let you figure it out. 
We also want to hear your stories of what is happening that you didn't see before, that is amazing you, that is showing maybe a new route, a new direction, a new hope, because we need to hear those stories. We need to hear those stories from you. And so I invite you to share those and I invite you to embrace the fact that God is with us, God is moving us through this time, and that hope is always a hope. We don't see it, but it's a hope. But it is faith that God will complete it and do it that takes us there. We will get there. Let us travel in love. Let us travel with hope. Gratitude is absolutely central to faith. One of the moments that caused me to understand that at a new level was when I realized the root word for gratitude in both Greek and in Latin is grace. So in, in Greek it's charis and then in Latin it's gratia. And so, so the root word for gratitude is also the root word for grace. It's also the root word for gifts. And so these three things are, in a sense, utterly indistinguishable. As soon as you are talking about faith, we're talking about the territory of grace and gifts, and then our response to that, gratitude. And you can use the same exact word in those two amazing ancient languages, which formed so much of the basis of Christian theology. You use the exact same word to describe all of that. And so if we talk about faith being grace alone, grace, free gifts with no other, no strings attached, uh, we are really talking about the flow of gratia, the throw of charis from God. And that results in a return, not in a sense of debt. It's not a debt that we have to discharge. But when we realize that that kind of grace, that those kinds of gifts have flooded into our lives, the natural response is the outflowing of love. Um, so that's our gratitude, is that outflowing of love. That's expressed toward God and our neighbor. So if you can't understand the centrality of gratitude to faith, you probably missed what faith really is. What is faith? Well, faith is, is the ability to trust and to, to live in that uh, vision of, of grace. That grace is truly all that there is, that grace flows from the deepest abundance of God, the deepest abundance of creation, um, that it is the truest nature of things. And sometimes that's very hard to see because the episodes of our lives obscure that, whether they are episodes of violence or victimization or suffering or our, of our own stupidity that can obscure the reality of gifts and grace. But as uh, scripture itself says, in all things give thanks. Um, it doesn't say for all things give thanks. Don't give thanks for the violence. Don't give thanks for your stupidity. Don't give thanks for your poverty. But it says in all things there is gratitude, there's thanks, there's gratia, there's charis. And so our capacity to know that and to act out of that, the in all things, there is grace, there is gratitude um, beyond the immediate pain of our own lives. That's what faith is. What is great, what does gratitude have to do with prayer and worship? Yeah. One of, the th one of the things that is important to realize is that I think uh, we have a tendency to want to give thanks for stuff. Is that, and every time we uh, say, oh, thank you that I got enough money to pay the water bill this month, or thank you 
that some unexpected gift arrived to me that made my life materially better, or thank you for the fact that I have a beautiful house. We should say thank you for all of those things, but in the United States in particular, we have a tendency to think that that's all you give thanks for, is material well blessings, uh, or, or material blessings or well-being. Um, so health and wellness becomes our main template for saying thank you. Uh, that sh that's not bad, but it's not the whole story. And so, but as soon as we turn it into health and wealth, we basically turned it into an economic vision of gratitude. And gratitude is far more than that. Gratitude is a disposition of our connection to one another, of our stewardship for the good gifts of the earth, of our ability to care and to give away gifts of our own lives. And so it's a uh, gratitude sometimes arrives on our step, our doorstep as an economic blessing, but it should immediately take us as, it, well, it should take us as we grow through life uh, to a place of far more depth than that and realize that gifts are more than just money or, or, or health. Uh, gifts are all kinds of things um, and that those gifts show up and do cause our lives to be blessed and we are called to pass them on to other people. You know, they can be as, as, as little as a, a small, smile or a nod on a day that you're feeling bad. That's a gift too and there's nothing economic about it. And so being able to have, to recognize what our gifts um, on any given day of our lives and to feel the connection that those gifts provide uh, for us is truly uh, a good way to live. I'm thankful to Dr. Diana Butler Bass for bringing that message to us and sharing with us the meaning of the word kairos and that that root has the, is the same to do with grace and with gift. We do not give to get something back. Grace is all gift. It's given to us just to take. And when we receive that gift, we know that we have received grace. We want to share it. It multiplies. I want to thank you for your sending your gifts. I want to thank you so much. They are making such a difference. We continue to worship and now reach a broader audience than we have, reaching hundreds of people. So thank you for your gifts that help us to reach out with a word of hope. Thank you for your gifts that continue to help us reach out to those who are hungry, who need shelter, to contribute to Peace Neighborhood Center, Delanus, Food Gathers, Safe House, Alpha House, and so many others. These are your gifts and action, and the Holy Spirit blesses them and multiplies them. I also want to thank you so much for the pledges that you have sent for the 2020-2021 fiscal year. We are hoping to expand our ministries, to have a broader reach here in our community, and your gifts are making an enormous difference. Many of you are already aware of the wonderful and exciting things that are happening, and there's never been a time where it's been more needed than right now. 30 million people out of work, many people wondering where to turn for a sense of hope. And we want to share that word of hope that comes from Jesus Christ, our Savior, who shares what, what it is to see what God's face looks like. So thank you, and may God bless these gifts that have been shared and use them to the glory of God's name. Thank you. We now go to our prayers, and this is another way that we respond to God's word and love. If you've heard me said, we respond to God's word and love by sharing our gifts, choosing to be baptized, uh, and lifting up our prayers. 
both our praises and both our needs. And it is okay to say, God, I need help. That truly is a sign of faith to reach up and say, you know what, God, what I'm dealing with is bigger than I am. Sure, maybe you can handle it, but why do it alone? Why not reach out for help? You know, right now, I'm thinking about so many people who are being affected. Again, millions of people out of work, over 30 million. College students who have had their program year interrupted, who have lost uh, study abroad and many other uh, jobs that they require. They've had to leave their apartments and places where they live. They don't even know what they're going to do to make ends meet. Students and teachers trying to do the right things from home. So many people are responding to meet these needs are on the front line. Our first responders such as police and fire and EMS and our custodians and grocery workers, doctors, nurses, pastors, mothers, and we want to remember them in our prayers. And you may even have specific names of particular people who fall into those categories. Would you join me in prayer? And as we go into prayer, you are welcome to, and you're invited, to please share your prayer request right in the comments. Uh, you see, you'll see them streaming. Please include information that you know would be okay to share. And we look forward to receiving those and sharing them again next week. Let us take a few breaths and let us go to God in prayer. As you breathe in, breathe in God's grace. And as you exhale, release all the things that are bigger than you are. God is here and in our midst. Gracious God, we pray that we experience your presence in a way that is very real, where we can sense your presence, where we can grab a hold of that presence and love. Let your presence shape us, guide us, guide us in healthy directions. We pray that you help all of those who are working in science and the medical field to discover a vaccine and to help us find testing that can help us to know how to return to work, how to bring an economy back because people are hurting. For all of those who have been laid off, millions, gracious God, we pray because we know that they are scared. Their families are scared. They feel disillusioned and they don't know where to reach. We pray that we will all work together as Christians to find practical ways to help. But we also pray, God, that each of these people experiences your love through many places, including us. For those who have had surgery these past weeks, we pray for continued healing and wholeness. For those who are going through chemotherapy and other treatments, such as dialysis, we pray for a treatment that helps them maintain a lifestyle that keeps them going in meaningful ways. Gracious God, for those who are anxious, for those who are depressed, for those who are experiencing post-traumatic stress, help them to be able to name that they are hurting. Help them to be able to reach out and know they're not alone. Help them to choose life. Gracious God, we pray for all those who have children at home. Let them know that they do not have to be perfect. You do not have to always be perfect and hold it all together all the time, but that we are just called to love and do the best we can each day. Help us to receive your grace. Help us to give ourselves the grace you give us and help us to share that grace. We pray that you guide the leaders of our nation and of our world in right paths. In Jesus' name, amen.
hope today's worship service has made you feel more hopeful, more guided, and that you understand perhaps what God may be speaking to you and what directions you may need to go. If you ever need anything, you can contact the church. You can also go to our webpage and you can look up Bethlehem UCC in Ann Arbor or www.bethlehem-ucc.org and there you can find out what all is happening this week and in the future in our community. You can read our newsletter, more about our values, the exciting things that are happening such as Zoom cafes, Zoom fellowship, uh, Zoom prayer meetings, so many different opportunities to share. You know, after this service, we will be having a Zoom fellowship hour. As you can see, our beautiful fellowship hall that was just remodeled looks very strange, doesn't it? Normally, right now, we would see tables across this room filled with people sitting in chairs, drinking coffee, eating refreshments. I miss that, and I know you too. So I invite you to come for a fellowship time on Zoom where we can talk with each other and you can make that pot of coffee at home or have that uh, bagel or refreshment and we can talk together. I hope that with this benediction you will feel blessed and that's what a benediction is, a blessing. And so this blessing is for you, for all of us. May God always guide you. May God always uplift you when you feel low. May God always draw close to you when you feel lost. And may you always know that God has always loved you. That God loves you right now exactly as you are. And that God will love you forever and ever with no take backs ever. Go with peace, go with grace, go knowing that you were blessed and loved.